Whitetails are known for their incredibly diverse appetite. Now, most people look at whitetails and they'll think, oh, they're grazers, but they aren't. They aren't like cattle and other animals that just graze across the field. Instead, they are what you call concentrate selectors. So they will go from plant to plant and selectively select the best part of the best plants that are available on the landscape. Whitetail's nutritional needs vary from season to season, obviously, but if you want to think about it in easy terms, think about it this way. Minerals, protein, carbohydrates, and then nutrient-dense foods. And that's going to take you from spring all the way through winter. And how this works, in spring, coming out of winter, they need those minerals because they're going to be zapping the minerals out of their skeletal system to make up for what they don't have. And that's why mineral supplementation is important throughout the whitetail's range throughout the spring and summer months. Protein is gonna go hand in hand with minerals going from spring into summer. Does need it for lactation, bucks need it for body growth and antler growth, and fawns need it to build up strength fast. And then as we shift to fall, it's gonna shift more to carbohydrates. Things like corn and soybeans, that's gonna give deer the energy they need to start getting into fall, the breeding season, the rut. And protein is also important. And then finally we get to the winter, and I'm gonna say late winter, early spring months, deer are gonna shift more to nutrient-dense foods. Now that's gonna be a tough sell for some of them because they might not have access to them, especially those northern deer. And that's where we find trouble in the deer herd when deer can't get the proper nutrition that they need. And as hunters, we have to be in tune with that. Whether we're scouting deer in the summer or we're hunting them in the fall or winter, we have to know what the deer is eating in order to know where the deer is at. The white-tailed deer's digestive system is complex and so fascinating when you look at it. You have the rumen, the reticulum, the omasum, and the abomasum. That four-chambered stomach allows the deer to eat just about anything and derive nutrients from it. The rumen, that's the big chamber, the main one where the food goes in. It's basically the storage vault until it starts getting broken down and digested by the rest of the body. The next one is the reticulum. This starts breaking down the matter a little bit and allows for that cud chewing process. But that's how they get the nutrients out of the food, whether it's woody brows or leafy green vegetation, or even farm crops, they have to chew it again to break it down to where it goes to the omasum and the abomasum. The omasum is where the water comes in and helps dissolve the nutrients to where it gets to the abomasum, and that's where the nutrients are then filtered into the lower intestines. They really need that four-chambered stomach, that complex system, to break down those things that we normally wouldn't think you could eat to where it's something that they can actually survive off of. Now their digestive systems are not built for abrupt changes and that's why you see those curves of feeding activity, uh, behavior so to speak, what they're targeting at what times a year, it slowly changes. Even with a full stomach, a deer can starve in winter because its stomach's bacteria colonies just have not adjusted to the food that was suddenly placed in front of it. By placing food there right abruptly that they have not been eating, that they have not been acclimated to during that point, and that's the key thing to remember. People say, well, deer eat corn all the time. Why would it be bad for me to go put corn out there? Because they probably haven't had access to sufficient corn over the past three months. You can't just take it and place it in front of them like that abruptly because those microorganisms in their stomach have not adjusted. It takes time for that to adjust. And that's why, I, again, we say it's a slow curve from spring to fall to winter in that 
deer are going to eat a variety of foods. That's why they're select browsers. They're going to eat native browse, they're going to eat farm crops, they're going to eat food plots, they're going to eat whatever is out there, but it has to be consistent. In certain severe areas, deer can die with a full stomach because that stomach bacteria has not adjusted. Let's say they're going to come from December to March. You're talking several months and they've been just eating nothing but woody browse that they can find in the woods and then somebody comes out with a gravity box of corn and dumps it out there for them, their stomach is not ready to handle that. It basically causes a massive disruption in their digestive system. They can't handle it and they're not, if they do survive, they're not gonna come through winter in a healthy state where they should be. We always say the most critical time for deer growth is in spring because if there is a gap, it's going to affect it. If it's a doe, it's going to affect her body as far as her weight, her birthing weight, and how much she can provide her newborn fawn. It's going to affect a fawn's growth because that last few weeks of its growth in the womb is critical. And it's going to affect bucks growth, especially their headgear. The natural foods that they're gonna prefer in fall are gonna be things like acorns, other woody browse species, and even some soft mass that's gonna be high in calcium, phosphorus, and potassium. There's a lot of other things that they need, but those are the main building blocks that deer need in fall as they get ready for winter so they can enter winter in a healthy state. Coming up next on Deer and Deer Hunting TV, contributor Josh Honeycutt takes his dad Marty out for Kentucky's gun season in pursuit of a buck they call the Wide Eight. I have spent much time in the woods with my father Marty and he introduced me to the outdoors. So being able to share some tree stand time with him has been great. And last fall during the 2024 deer season, I was able to capture one of his greatest hunts right here in Kentucky. Deer and Deer Hunting TV is brought to you by It's rifle season in Kentucky and Josh and Marty are in the stand, but they aren't alone. You can hear the combine back behind me. He's actually finishing up all the crops, the last of the crops here on this farm. With standing corn and other crops, deer have plenty of food and cover, making it tough to locate and hunt mature bucks. That's why Josh and Marty actually welcome the sound of harvesting equipment. Once the fields are cut, it will likely encourage deer to move. With only a few days left in the season, they've set their sights on one of two trophy bucks that have been showing up regularly on their cuttybacks. Really after the Mega 10 and the Wide 8, one or the other. We've seen both of them today. We saw the Mega 10 on trail camera. We saw the Wide 8 in person. We accidentally jumped the Wide 8 and the doe. They were bedded down in a little half acre thicket way away from the rest of the deer. About an hour before dark, the farmer finished his work and left the freshly cut cornfield. It didn't take long for deer to start pouring out of the tree line. I just saw a doe pop out right up here where we accidentally jumped, you know, ran that wide, the, the wide eight, wide heavy eight up into. All right, we were right, heavy eight's just coming out. He just come out underneath the killing stand. He come out under the water hole where we got our scrape tree post. He just followed that doe, he's right there. How far is it? Right at 300, just under, just under 300. When that buck came back out, we immediately knew, okay, it's game time. Dad, get on the gun, get on the deer, and we're gonna see what we can do here. Before he gets away, you gonna shoot. You gonna stop him? 
or no? Yeah. Me. Me. Pretty sure I heard him go, saw him go down, but I ain't sure sure. Right here, big boy. We find it hard this week, ain't we? Found it pretty hard. Man, wide heavy eight. Man, this this stand's been pretty good this to is you. A good stand. It's been pretty good to you. Pretty good. He just walked right out there and stood side, broadside, and said, "Here I am, boy." Feel pretty good about the shot. We think we're gonna find him down and out. Just up there. I'm going down and I'm gonna go find my deer here in about 10 minutes. Oh, yeah. yeah, he's a good one. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, he did. Get them ass on that basis. I can't get my fingers around his bases. I told you he's heavy. He's probably a little heavier than the other deer we were after. We've been in here for five days after one of the two, and, and now we've got him, and he's a good one. Sure glad, glad to get him. He's heavy. heavy and I'm tired so we're gonna work him up and take him home. When my dad finally tagged the buck it was the rut but it was also all about food so how is that the case? Well once the rut arrives it's all about the does and where are the does? They're gonna be where the food's located. So that was the plan as we continued through deer season and dad continued to put time in the stand. Stay on the food find the hottest available sign and just be there when that buck presented a good daylight opportunity. And that's what finally happened. Also came with great lessons and, and reinforced really positive information that we were able to garner while we were on that hunt. And it just goes to show that during the peak rut, you gotta be careful about where those deer are gonna be bedded at. They can be bedded in very odd and weird locations. And that's a good tactic, a good play whenever you're in that peak rut phase. But also digestive diversity. Where we harvested that deer at was the peak food source, a cut cornfield, not just a cut cornfield, but a freshly cut cornfield, which is a big, big difference. When you have that combine that has just been through there very recently, that changes things. And the deer flock to that. It's just a magnetic force. In the deer hunting world We've got that fresh cut corn and that is incredibly important to remember. Get in there just as soon as those harvesters are done doing their work. And you just might harvest a deer too. Being scent free, regardless if I'm hunting whitetails like I'm doing right now here in Kansas or elk in the mountains, coyotes out on the prairies, I want to be scent free. So one of the things I rely on a lot is scent elimination spray. One of the best on the market that I feel is the Scent Killer Gold with Hunt Dry Technology Plus. The great thing about this scent elimination product, not only does it fight odor, but you spray it on your clothes, any good fabric gear like a backpack, and within hours and then later days and weeks, up to 20 days, it's still working with that Hunt Dry Technology Plus. Now, when you're using a product like this, it's obvious you're gonna spray your clothes, you're gonna spray your backpack, but remember the little things that you might forget. You know that favorite hunting hat you have? That brim, the brow right here, collects a lot of sweat. It's a good place to use scent elimination products odor fighting products. Another one that I think people overlook is the wrist harness on your bow. You know, the one you put your hand in and then hold the grip on your bow. That can get kind of grimy in the summer when you're doing all those 3D shoots when it's 90, 100 degrees out. Remember to spray that down. 
all these little things like that. Things you may never consider. Even the sheath on your knife that could be holding some odor. All those little things, remember, they need to be sprayed down with a product like Scent Killer Gold. Hey, putting products like this to use is great because when you're out in the woods, hey, you're gonna be odor free and way more successful on the hunt.